Hello and welcome back to Encyclopedia Podcastica. This is the science section of our episode on pyroviral hydrosonography. So let's jump right in. All right. Uh, so on. there are four main types of pyroviral hydrosonographs. Wow. There are terrestrial pyroviral hydrosonographs. Those are the earliest form that we touched on, uh, right? Mostly in the in the history section, they perform measurements of the Earth's pyroviral right. hydrosonometry data. So these are the ones that were produced about the 1650s, like the first ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're uh, yeah. they can be entirely analog. Um, you know, you can you can right. perform the measurements on the surface of the Earth. Uh, and there's no like interference, right? Um, yeah, and they're they're the least powerful of the pyroviral hydrosonometers, and they're only able to measure down to about the kilometer range. Wow. Yeah, so they That's they're not, not their resolution all. is pretty bad. Wow. Um, but you know they they were the first ones, and that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then uh, next came the solar pyroviral hydrosonographs. These were much higher powered, uh, and they allowed for measurements of the sun's pyroviral hydrosonometry data. And they are, they're the third most powerful pyroviral hydrosonometers, and they're able to measure down to about a meter. Wow. So they're a lot better. Like So, so are those better. like, those are like land-based? Yeah, these yeah. are all, um, you basically only need a space-based right. one to, to do stellar okay, pyroviral okay. hydrosonometry. Uh, so yeah, then there's lunar pyroviral hydrosonometry uh, or son sonographs. They're uh, they're very high powered. Uh, they can measure the moon's pyroviral hydrosonometry data. Uh, they're the second most powerful ones, and they're able to measure about down to about one micrometer. Wow, the micrometer is like it's a millionth. It's a uh, yeah million a millionth meter. of a meter. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, then there are stellar pyroviral hydrosonographs. These have to be out in space. Okay. Uh, you know, you, there's too much atmospheric interference to to have them. Uh, right. To so have a ground base. They're extremely based. sensitive. Yeah, they're very yeah. sensitive. Uh, so they're they're uh, they need like near zero atmospheric interference to work. Wow. Uh, they're the most powerful pyroviral hydrosonometers. And they measure in the range of about 15 to 500 nanometers. Wow. Uh, and GASP, the, <gasps> uh, the, the new space-based uh, one that hasn't been launched yet, right. has a theoretical maximum resolution of one nanometer. Wow. It's so like it's a, like way it's better a than... a billionth of a meter. Yeah. It's way yeah. better than the, the best ground-based pyroviral hydrosonograph. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so every... So yeah, those are the four. So types. wait, wait, wait. So um, you said you had a, your friend. Um, yeah, he, his, he has a, a terrestrial, just terrestrial one. Yeah. So yeah, so it's not very, not very accurate. So yeah, do you know yeah. what kind of range can, he gets with that, or um, about a kilometer. About a kilometer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The you don't really get into like less than a kilometer until you get to like the very expensive machines that are like right. Right, pretty big. It's just—it's kind of like a toy one, right? Just to play around. Well, with. <laughs> it's not a toy. I mean, oh, well, okay. we're still talking like multiple thousands of dollars. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. We'll say a very expensive toy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so every pyroviral hydrosonograph has two main parts. There's the pyroviral hydrosonometer, and that's the actual measurement device. Uh, okay. It uses an oscillating virometer in an aqueous pyroactive acoustic bath, and each okay. oscillation of the virometer is counterbalanced by a reciprocating rotary cam that drives the acoustic source. And harmful resonance spikes are avoided by a compensating shaft that disrupts the waveform and doesn't allow doesn't allow it to get too even. Right. Uh, so we take that data and we interpret we interpret that data from the oscillating virometer with a Fourier analysis function that gives us the proper density coefficients. And I know this is like pretty, it's pretty like serious. Yeah, you yeah, know, sciencey but, stuff. Um, I'm kind of surprised they don't have like nice short acronyms. You know, like silly acronyms to. <laughs> 
describe some of this stuff, but you know, you know, they're scientists. They're, yeah. they're not that cool, I guess. Yeah, there weren't. Um, uh, well, there are some names for other parts. So yeah, uh, but uh, you know the the actual measurement device. Yeah, doesn't have any of those yeah. acronyms. Uh, so those density coefficients are fed into the extruder for reconstitution into its source form. And right. so, yeah, now we'll get on to the extruder. So there's a part known as the boron oxidized nanoscale extruder or the bone. Right. And that is the recording mechanism for pyroviro-hydrosonometry data. Uh, and in early pyroviro-hydrosonographs, they used carbon instead of boron. Uh, but nowadays we use boron because it just has like better chemical properties. Okay. For it. Um, like, do you know specifically what, what it's doing better? Just better recording kind of? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to look into that, you know, more closely. Uh, but yeah, so, so modern pyroviro-hydrosonographs use two types of bones in a grid. Uh, there's a single kinetic Newtonian emission extruder, so K-N-E-E, -E, or knee bone. And there's also uh, large extruder grid bones, or leg bones. And inside the main grid, the leg bones connected to the knee bone. <laughs> well, that totally makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so that grid format of the extruders ensures proper application of the density regulators over the surface. Of course, because that's, that's what you really want. Yeah. The, so the proper ap application of the density regular regulators over the surface. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, that actually is important. Right. Because um, if you if you improperly uh, apply them, then you're going to get an uneven measurement. Which right. Which you don't want to do. Yeah, because yeah. that'll ruin all the data. Right. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, uh, so that's all I have for the science section. Okay. Um, it's but short yeah. and sweet. Uh, yeah, it's pretty short. But uh, are there any questions from our audience? I got a question. Okay. In the history section, you were mentioning there was a transition in early measurement devices from um, titanium to zirconium. What was uh, behind that? Um. Yeah, I don't remember the the specific reason, but you know, it I think it was just the availability, out. right? The like um, titanium, or I thought titanium was fairly available. I know I use it that use titanium white and and painting, and that's cheaper. Well, I, I mean, like the we're we're better able to extract it. Oh, okay, the zirconium. Uh, like it took some technological advances to be able to extract it the, and okay, and use it. Yeah, yeah. it's the science part. So. What is the acronym? Is there an acronym for this? Um, for the... This long name? Pyroviro-hydrosonography? <laughs> um, well, it's all one word, so... G... Yeah. Some, uh, sometimes... I mean, I guess you could call it like PVHSG, but... <laughs> People seem to say it all the time. Yeah. I, mean, I, I didn't really um, I didn't see anybody see any abbreviating it of any, any, yeah, yeah. any sort. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. Yeah. Abbreviation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I usually see it written out fully. Yeah. I would say P P V H T. I'm interested in the. Uh, There's no T. Of this machine, and you uh, announced it by doing Fourier analysis. That is heavy duty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so earlier machines wouldn't wouldn't use that but um basically to to uh to get better data out of the machine we we now apply functions to it um to the the raw data uh but earlier machines basically would just get analog data so you'd you'd record them on a drum and you'd look at the the waveforms there yeah so where is this thing <laughs> Where, where is it? There's probably a few like famous ones. Like NASA probably has a couple of them around. I don't actually remember, uh, except for the you know the GASP one that they're they're working on putting in space. Yeah, I think there's a um, there's a lunar one at Stanford. Okay. Yeah. Is that near the the Stanford dish or no? Probably not. No, it's no. it's a lot smaller than than the dish. Well, yeah, it's yeah. But it's like uh, 
I don't know where it is, but yeah, I I've read about it. Stanford's lunar pyrovirohydrosonograph. Okay. Yeah. Is it available for people to go look at? And check I out don't the data know. and everything? I don't, <laughs> I don't think so, but I think if you were like, you know, at at Stanford, if you go to Stanford, you probably have. No, his friend. My has friend it. has a terrestrial one. It's much yeah. smaller. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. big it's about yeah. the size of like a laser printer. So um, like it's maybe a yeah, foot and a bad. half, like two feet by like about three feet tall. Yeah. But that's only okay. a terrestrial one. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It's 110 volts. Um, it's, Do you need it? I have plug? no idea. <laughs> Did it have a special plug on it or you didn't see it? I didn't no, see okay. it. Okay. You know, I, these are very useful machines, and I, I was surprised in your review of this. You left out any mention of the work of Willoughby. Willoughby. Working in southern Illinois back about 1920 was the one that worked out the interface between the atrium and the revolving cam. And that was the critical link that allowed it to go from some kind of a, uh, what would you call it, a... a uh, a Leonardo type device. Right. That was yeah. The idea was there, but it didn't really work. But when Willoughby worked on it, it became a working item. So how, yeah. how could you do all this research and miss him? Well, it was oh, functional boy. before that. Um, like it wasn't that there was no scientific uses for it, um, but it wasn't really used for like it wasn't used for lunar use, and it wasn't used for for stellar use yeah um yeah i must uh sometimes i have to cut stuff out of the history section you know if it's it's running along this one was shorter than i expected so you know well, didn't make it <laughs> the rule of d has been neglected throughout the really of this yeah and i just wanted to bring it to your attention because he's my distant grandfather oh okay yeah that's awesome that's cool um well, we got it in. Well, yeah, we yeah. Sh- we should do a uh, a waifu on that then. Right, right. I'll have to come back to it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so uh, any other questions? Nope. With the stellar All right. versions, you mentioned that they have to be in outer space, so they don't. There's no atmospheric interference. But how do you deal with things like cosmic rays and X-ray, for example? Uh, I believe they're just really well shielded. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. Actually, I would want to know how does the how does like zero G's? Yeah, work? I didn't even usually the like the terrestrial ones, and they actually have to use gravity a little. little yeah, because you yeah. you rely on gravity to hold the the drum. Yeah, don't they the, the ones in space that they spin to like sort of simulate gravity? I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's we'll get back uh, to you on that one. Yeah, yeah, we'll put that additionally in our waifu. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so thank you, Matt. Thank you, Hunter. And we want to thank Cyber SDF for letting us use their songs Welcome and Mellow Acid as our intro and outro music. And we want to thank the humanist community in Silicon Valley for co-producing with us. And we especially want to thank our studio audience. And if you're watching on YouTube, remember to hit the subscribe button and hit the like button, and we will see you down in the comments. And I hope you didn't believe any of this, because yeah. April Fools! April Fools! <laughs> <laughs> Encyclopedia Podcastica is a production of the Silicon Valley Skeptics, an organization dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. You can find us on Twitter at SV Skeptics or Facebook at facebook.com slash svskeptics. You can contact us at svskeptics at gmail.com. If you like the show, please rate us on iTunes.